So um, <clears throat> I don't usually like to talk so much at night while we're here, so since everybody's yapping all day, so it's, we're just taking this time to squeeze all the talk in for me. What we'll do is uh, we'll take questions and uh, we'll talk. We'll discuss among ourselves. Good topic. So it's usually the badmashis in the back that are making noise. Betlo <laughs> tum, betlo. Uh, it's great to have KK here, you know. Uh, Ramesh was telling you the story this morning about how we came to Maharaji, how we actually met him. And what he didn't mention is that KK didn't tell us that story until about four or five years later. So, luckily. He didn't tell us what really happened that day, you know. And should I refresh you, or do you already you understand? Are you alive, actually? <laughs> I mean, and, and cognizant? Yes, okay. Uh, just checking, since there are bodies in the room. I'm starting now. Where's the lasagna? Okay. You know, I think more than anything, what we, uh, th those of us who met Maharaji in the body and, or not, who consider ourselves to be his devotees, I think what we share is uh, more than anything, the way we see our lives, you know? Uh, the way we see our day, how we see ourselves in, the, in relation to uh, all the stuff that happens to us in a life. Ram Das once said, you know, I think more than anything what we share with people is our faith in Maharaji. And that faith is based on experience, it's not blind faith. Nothing, you know, blind faith is useless, you know, and, and destructive and dangerous. But faith or confidence is what comes from actually having the experiences yourselves of, of, of the truth of the thing in your own life, in your daily life. You know, I joke around a lot that, uh, that I mope around less now and that I miss it. And it's true. Both things are true. Sometimes I mope around just for fun, you know. I just walk around the house and go, oh, fuck, man, this is hard. It's because it feels so natural to me. It's, everybody has a unique natural state. <clears throat> but really, you know, from the chanting, I've been chanting a long time, and it seems I still consider myself a beginner. Really, I do. I mean, uh, But I, I, I'm, I've seen the way that chanting has remained the same while my life has changed all around it. Um, I don't know quite how to explain that other than to say that all those long periods of being in heavy, negative states of mind, they just don't seem to arise as much or as often as they used to. And when they do, they don't seem to last as long. That's a big thing. Because when you're sitting in one of those moods or one of those states, you can't do anything with it, you know? It's like you can't, uh, you can't move it, you can't, you can breathe it, <laughs> you know? It doesn't go anywhere, you know? You can chant all day, and nothing happens, you know. It's what we do 
at the other moments when we have a vote that affects those moments when we don't seem to have much of a vote, which for a lot of us is a lot of the time. How do we get a vote? How do we get a vote on how we go through the day, right? We wake up in the morning, and we start writing, directing, producing, and acting in the movie of me. All day long. What am I doing now? What am I going to do now? Do they like me? They won't like me. I won't like this. I'll wear this. I won't wear this. I'll do this. Blah, 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 blah. Well, if I do this, will that happen? It never stops. It never stops. I don't know if you've noticed that. I'm just going to turn my phone off. Oh, senior moment I already did. So, um, what, when we chant, we're, we're, we're chanting what they call the names of God in India, right? I don't know about you. That, that doesn't really fly with me. I don't know what God is. I don't even know if there really is a God. A God up there in the sky running the show. I know there's love. And I know there's love because of Maharaji. That's the only thing I know. Because I know that it changes the way I go through my day, it changes the way I think about myself and think about others. Because I remember what it was like before I didn't know that. And by the way, the moment I knew that was the very first moment that I met Ram Dass in America. I didn't, hadn't been to India yet. I didn't know about Neem Karoli Baba. But I heard there was this guy who just came back from India, and so I went to see him. And the moment I walked into the room where he was, without a word being spoken, I knew. Not a word was spoken, and I knew that whatever it is I was looking for was real. Now, this is back in the, you know, the 1700s, you know. <laughs> there wasn't a yoga studio on every corner, and there wasn't books on this shit all day long. There was like two books, three books I had read. One was Autobiography of a Yogi, Gospel of Ramakrishna, and I think Zen in Japanese culture, and that was it. And, you know, they were nice books, but they were books. And I wasn't, you know, they seemed cool, but I didn't... I liked it a lot, uh, but I didn't, you didn't, I didn't know in my heart if it was real. And when I walked into the room with Ram Dass, I knew that immediately. Something just, the light went on. Oh, it's real. And then this next thought was, it's in the world, it can be found. So that's, that was it, that's, that's faith. That was my experience. And from that experience I got faith. And it's, it's faith or understanding, real understanding that allows us to make a deal with us, ourselves, to do the practices that we need to do to train ourselves to let ourselves be free of the stuff that rules us. We don't get much vote about what thoughts pass through our consciousness. The only vote we get is that moment when we become aware that something's got us. And at that moment, depending on a lot of different factors, we can choose to let go of that for just for a second. I mean, usually these things come back, they're not a big depression. You just don't say, go on, get out of here. 
and it laughs at you. But if we've done practice, if we're accustomed to letting go, those things float through and they don't grab us the same way. In fact, the very first time I experienced this directly was in Kenji. Um, Maharaji had, uh, one, one of the Indian kirtan walls had uh, kind of come on to one of the Western women in the satsang. And Maharaji found out about it. And so all 20 of these guys were loaded on the back of a truck with all their stuff driven down to the train and sent back home to Brindavan. And uh, one of the Indian people said, Baba, you just kicked out the kirtan wallas. Who's going to sing now? Guess. <laughs> so all day long we had to sit there, you know. Uh, it was horrible. <laughs> Unbelievably horrible. I mean, yeah. first of all, I hardly, I hardly played harmonium. I hardly knew any melodies. So I would just sit there and go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. And, you know, we only had one instruction, sing. There was nothing about for how long or when we might stop. It was like eternal damnation. All day long. And so there I was, you know, and uh, uh, the mind starts to get very creative in moments like that. When you ask, ask it to pay attention, you know. So I'm going, while I'm singing, I'm replaying my life from, let's see, when I was three. Wow, yeah, I remember that hat I had when I was three. That was cool. Yeah, it was like this, Hare Krishna. And this kept going on and on and on and on. After a couple of weeks of pretty much like 8, 10, 12 hours a day, I would be singing and I would notice a thought coming through. And it would go. And it, I wasn't thinking it. It was a thought. I, a thought means like something with content, you know, that you usually think. But it, I wasn't think. I wasn't thinking. The thought was just going through. And Hare Krishna was going on. And Hare Krishna was home base. The mantra was home base. And I was leaning back into it and relaxing. And it was just going on. And the thoughts were coming and going. And it was the first time in my life that I was... Uh, ever freed from that oppressiveness of the constant thinking and f emotions and on and on. There was a second time, actually, but it was actually before that, and of course I was on a thousand micrograms of acid. <laughs> I was lying in my bed and I'd been like, I don't know, out in the lawn playing with the dog for the last 10 hours. And, I don't know what I, and then I went home, I went inside and I lay down in the bed and I was kind of just gazing out the window like, what is that? Something was coming towards me. And I, I, I didn't know where it was. I could feel it though it was coming and it was coming closer and closer, closer and closer. Oh no, it's a thought. And I was thinking. And I was thinking. And then it started to leave. No, don't go. Don't go. And then it was gone and I was just. And then another one, right? And they started coming. It took a while, but they started coming more quickly and more quickly and leaving more quickly and quickly. And then after a while, I was just back. I was me again. And I saw me as just this group of thoughts that, I, that, I, that are me. And when they're not there, they're not there. But I am. Me is not there, but there's presence. You're there. That was a, that was a big thing. And so later on, but it's different when you, 
don't take 1,000 micrograms of acid. As you can imagine, it might be a little different. And it's, it was a deeper experience because it was happening in real time, kind of, you know? And I was chanting, and the thoughts were going through by themselves. And I was just, you know, good, watching them go. And we had to, I would have never had that experience if Maharaji hadn't forced us to sing. He forced us to sing. We didn't want to sing. We wanted to look at him. That's all we did. We, we stared at him. That was our practice. <laughs> and he pretended to like it. He would sit there and throw fruit at us and smile and laugh. That's what we did. I mean, that's all we ever wanted to do also. So when we were asked to like sit around the corner in this little room and chant for many, many hours, it was like being banished to inner darkness. It was terrible. But because of that, I actually was forced to have that personal understanding of the direction that this stuff moves us. So that's why when, we, when I share this practice with people, I, I just simply share it the way I do it. You know, Other people share it different ways. I don't. I, sh I say, sing. Pay attention. When you notice that you're dreaming and fantasizing and remembering and blah, 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 just come back to the chanting. The moment you notice you're gone or you've been gone, you're actually back. If you think about that, that's kind of miraculous. Why does that happen? How come? Why don't we just, aren't we gone forever? Well, most of us are. Well, they say that uh, you know, a, a thought has a certain amount of energy and it, it gets dissipated and then it releases you. You're, it, this thought disappears, dissipates and you're back, drops you back into your true nature for a billionth of a second. So when we chant, we keep repeating these names, we keep coming back to these names, which we don't know what they mean, but that's the way it's supposed to be. You can't know the meaning the real meaning of these names on the intellectual or emotional level. These names of our true being, which is beyond thought, beyond emotion. The, the mind, the intellect can't ever grok that. But we can know within what that is eventually because it's not outside of us. It's our true nature. It's our own hearts. We're calling the names of our own beings, our own hearts. <clears throat> so, when we chant, we simply pay attention. And I know that sounds kind of boring, but everything comes from that. You know, if you're trying to get through a door on the other side of the room, you kind of have to walk towards it. You can't walk in this direction and expect to go through that door. So paying attention is moving in the right direction. And when you go through the door of attention, you, there's a lot of stuff on the other side of the door but you don't see that on this side of the door. And no one can tell you what's going to be on the other side of the door. It's not a very good simile, but it makes a little sense. Everything you need to know is within you. Everything we need to know is within us. Nobody has to give us anything. You don't have to be initiated and, and by anybody. Uh, never mind. All you have to do is sit down and B, do some practice. Start paying some attention. Everything comes from that. Anyway, let's uh, take some questions and stuff.
If you have any, I will pretend I have answers. There's a, a microphone that I'll go around. You can ask anything and I can refuse to answer. I think you're right by the speaker, yeah, so. Yeah, stand up so, over there. So on my lanyard, it says, by his grace. Hold, hold a little closer. On the lanyard here, it says, by his grace. By his grace, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that Maharaji? Yeah, we're referring to Maharaji. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Everything I do refers to Maharaji. By his grace is also the name of a book written by one of Maharaji's great old devotees named Dada. Dada Mukherjee. Dada was too much. He was so extraordinary. He was a, a communist economics professor. In India, communism is a little different. It's more of an economic thing rather than a social thing. And uh, one day, uh, Dada was home with some of his friends, and uh, Dada's wife he was putting her shoes on to go outside, and Dada said, where are you going? And she said, well, I heard that there's a saint that comes to the little house across the street, and uh, I, wanted, I heard he's there, and I was going to go see him. Good. Dada wasn't interested in saints. So she, went, she goes out, and she walks across the, the street, and there's this little mud hut, very poor person's house, and no light inside, very dark. So she bends down and goes in, and she sits down, and, and the, the person who, who was sitting, the saint was sitting on a little cot, and he looked at her and called her by her first name, Kamala, go home. And she, she went, how, how did he know my name? And she didn't move, right? And a couple of minutes later, he looks back at her. I said, Kamala, go home. Your husband's friends are waiting for their tea. I'll come tomorrow. So she didn't know what to do. She had to leave, right? So she goes back to her house, and Dada says to her, why are you back so soon? And she tells him what happened, and he got curious, right? So the next day, he walks across the street with his wife, and they walk into this little house, and this saint stands up, grabs his hand, and starts walking out of the house, across the street to his house. And as he's walking and pulling Dada along, he says, from now on, I'll be staying with you. <laughs> I mean, think about that. You met some homeless guy in the supermarket? <laughs> and you go back out to your car, and he's sitting in the front seat, and he says, from now on, I'll be staying with you. <laughs> well, you know, they knew he was a saint, so they kind of said, okay, well. And so he sat down, and then some of the people from across the street came in and sat down, and then some of the ladies came, and they started preparing food, and more people started arriving, and food was prepared, and prasad was given out to everybody, and, and that was that. He left and came back. He kept coming and going. And then Dada became a devotee, just like, not just like that, but over years. There's another book called The Near and the Dear by Dada, which is so great. And in it, he talks about his friends that he met, the other older devotees. And, and his basic premise is that he never learned anything from Maharaji. Everything he learned about love and devotion was from the devotees who had already been with him for some time. And it's just, you really have to, you can really taste it. Is there a question in the back? A hand, were you just scratching or something? No, disappeared. Over here, somebody. Those books, by the way, are available uh, online. Is that correct? Yeah. They are available online. They're available. As iBooks and also from Amazon, I think, right? Yeah. Yes, okay, there you go. I think you have some of them, one of them at least there. Go ahead. Oh, um, you said yesterday and then again. The, the microphone, hold it like this. Okay. You said yesterday and today that when you saw Ram Dass, um, you knew that what you've always wanted existed. 
Was it love? What was it that you always wanted? I don't... I don't, I don't know how to describe it. I figured. But... <laughs> But I can tell you, nobody had to tell me yeah. that I what it was. I hear you. And that's what it feels like. Yeah. It's like when you fall in love. Somebody has to tell you, oh, I heard you fell in love today. Oh, really? I didn't notice. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, you fall into whatever that is. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Krishna. Hi. Hi. Um, question. I'm struggling a little bit with, um, as far as spiritual practice, I'm having a bit of a problem with doing it right, um, which I'm sure no one else struggles with. Um, I'm developing a really good relationship with a lot of people at the Hare Krishna Temple where I live. And my spiritual practice is very slowly but surely progressing. To what? From what? I, well, from being a drug addict to being a non-drug addict. I don't mm -hmm. know. That's I mean, a good direction. To go it's with. certainly saved my life. It's cheaper. It's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and there's job security. So. Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, I'm trying to fit in. Um, you know, I really try to incorporate people from temple. I'd like to have them come over and let's have a feast at my house and let's have kirtan and all this kind of stuff. But they're like, no, I can't come over because you have dogs. And, you know, all the rules with the Krishnas right. are really um, creating a wall. And I can't break it down because they just keep rebuilding. Why do you want to? Maybe it's not the way you're supposed to go. But I love the Gita. I love the scripture. I love the saying, the, the talkings of Prabhupada. Right. But oh, yeah. I also love these people, and I want them to come to my house without freaking out because I have a dog. I mean, you know, the little things, the little, you know, I can't. Well, you have two choices. Okay. Get rid of the dog. No. -uh. Or uh, you know, just go to the temple and enjoy yourself. What's the problem? I think you're looking for a little security of a, of a satsang, which is a very good thing to look for. Perhaps you're not looking in the right place for you. You're not finding it, so maybe you should look somewhere else. They, they have their tradition, which they teach, which they share, which they believe in, and they don't accept other ways of doing things. Period. That's it. So either you do it their way or you don't do it with them. There's no halfway. Yeah. So, that's it. What are you going to do? Travel with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is very small. I'm allergic. <laughs> I'm, I'm really allergic. She's, no, no, no. She's hypoallergenic. I just got more allergic. Five pounds. Five Even pounds. Even more. I can hardly breathe. <laughs> Fine. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I understand I, from a little bit you're telling about your history and what your life, I could see there's been a lot of hard times mm -hmm. and you're, you're looking for some, some friends, really, right? I just, I want a home. Well. I want a spiritual home. You have that. That's you. You know, it's not out there. What you're looking for is some support. And that's available in many different ways, many, uh, from many different teachings, and there are many teachers out there with groups in different places. But if you're not comfortable, would you trust yourself, for Christ's sake? What's wrong with you? You've got to trust yourself. <laughs> you're, everything you're, you're, you know, you don't seem to, di you believe what, you're, what you're, your experience is, but then you kind of, you want to step on them. You're telling me this, they won't come to my house because I have a dog. You can say that from now until like the next yuga, and that's not gonna change, as long as your dog lives that long, to the next yuga. So you have to deal with reality, right? What you're looking for is good, you need that. So look somewhere where you could find it. You're not finding it where you're looking. There's, 
that's not an incorrect uh, assessment of the situation, <laughs> right? So, you know, try to be a little patient with yourself, which is not easy, right? Yeah. But that's, that's the key to it all. Let life come to you a little bit. Don't be so afraid. Not doing sometimes is better than doing, as you know, right. on every level, right? Yeah. yeah. Once you've done all you can do, then you can't do anymore, so you just have to wait. But waiting is also being, you know, I mean, don't, it's better than banging your head against a wall that, that's not going to give in. Right. I'm not criticizing uh, ISKCON, I'm just saying that they do things a certain way. And they're not going to change. So either you're a part of that or you're not. And uh, some of my closest friends are uh, ISKCON Swamis, you know, and they're fantastic. Really, I do have very close friends in ISKCON, and, and the devotion is wonderful, but it's, it's a particular way of doing it. Mm. And even in Brindavan, there's many, many ways of doing it. And Brindavan is Krishna's place. There's guys who go around going, Jai Shri Krishna, and there's guys who go around, Jai Shri Radhe. And then the guys going, Radhe, Radhe, Krishna, Krishna, you know, Hare Krishna, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, everybody. Everybody, you know, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. <laughs> it's, you're, you, what you're looking for is real, it's good, it's wholesome, it's fantastic, you know what it is. So trust that and look for that. Don't, don't look where it isn't. When you don't find it, that means it's not there. Actually, can you imagine that? That you could trust yourself. <laughs> the, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Because yeah. we're, not we're not trained to trust ourselves. Not from day one. We're not trained to trust. So, right. but that's the, that's the whole thing. Because when you really trust yourself, then you know what, who you are. So the whole path is about removing the non-trusting yourself, your true nature, your real self, which you already have. And all you're doing is clearing away the bullshit. And that's what's going to be there, because it's already there. You don't need anything. You want something, I understand, because you feel that it will help, and it could, if it comes to you. If it doesn't, what are you going to do? You're not going to get rid of the dog, that's for sure. So, be you. Be you with the dog. You know, there's a great story of uh, uh, Yudhisthira, who is the king of the Pandavas. Arjuna was his brother, Bhima, you know, the five brothers. And Yudhisthira was supposed to be the incarnation of Dharma, of righteousness. <laughs> so, uh, probably get this story wrong, but I usually do, but I'll get close. So after he left the body, uh, it's, it's decreed that all kings uh, must go visit hell, right? But uh, anyway, uh, so everywhere he went through his, as he left the body, the different spheres and worlds that he passed through, there was this little dog with him. He didn't know where the dog came from, you know? but the dog was with him everywhere he went. So, um, let's see now. There's a couple of things that happened. One thing that happened, he gets to heaven and uh, he looks around for his brothers and his family and they're not there. And, uh, and uh, he says, well, I don't want to be in heaven if... Uh, my, my brothers aren't here. Where are they? And uh, his guide says, well, I don't think you really want to know. He said, no, I want to know. Tell me. He says, well, okay, come with me. And there they are. They're sitting in hell, and there are his brothers. And your sister says, this is where I want to be. I don't care what it's like. And, of course, immediately the scene changes, and they're back in heaven, because that was just a test, right? So then... As he's about to enter into heaven with his brothers, the, the, the gatekeeper says, well, you can come in, but not the dog. 
I, I wonder what group he was in. I know. You can come in, but not the dog. He said, oh, no. This dog has followed me through, you know, thick and thin, through everything. I'm not going to uh, abandon this dog. So at that moment, the dog turns into his father, Dharma, the, you know, the king of Dharma. And they all enter the heaven worlds together. So you have to trust yourself and do what's right for you. That's the best thing you could ever do. And that's the way everything will come to you because you're allowing it to by your trust of yourself. By, you know, I'm not saying you have to love every little bit of part of yourself, but if something's not working, okay, it's not working. It's not that there's anything wrong with you. It's just that it's not working for better, whatever, right? Next, right? When I started to chant, uh, there wasn't a lot of chanting going on nor was there anybody to tell me how I should do it in America, right? right. I mean, uh, you know. So I did what I thought I should do, which was to sing what I like. Why would I sing what I don't like? And that's what I still do. And if I didn't sing what I like, I doubt you'd be here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because you, tell I, I, you could tell I didn't really like it. So I'm actually singing, I'm doing exactly what I want to do, I give or take, you know, a few other things, you know. Like I can't eat ice cream anymore, you know. But there's good coconut ice cream, that's good. <laughs> so, f through following that part of you that knows, right, that's how you get stronger and stronger and you attract to yourself the things that you need. They'll come to you. A little patience. But you got your dog to keep you company. What's the big deal? Yes, I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you speak a little bit about where the melodies come from? I know they're traditional melodies, but do they come to you? Do you? How, how do you receive them, or how do you? How does that happen? What's that process like for you? Uh, I don't know, you know? I really don't know. I I've almost never sit down to write a kirtan. I'm usually driving and I'm singing something and I go, wow, I never heard that before. And then that's another kirtan. Sometimes I actually, on the, the last CD, Kirtan Walla, one of, the, one of the melodies I was actually singing in my dream when I woke up. So I, got, I quickly got the tape recorder because I know I don't have a brain. And I recorded it at like four in the morning and I went back to sleep. Of course, I didn't remember it in the morning, but I had the recorder. That's how Keith wrote the, uh, Keith Richards wrote the beginning to Satisfaction. So me and Keith have a lot of common. Yeah. I once, saw, I, I once saw an interview with Keith, I mean, and he was saying, Somebody asked him how they were. I said, oh man, you just kind of like open up to the universe and just comes through you. <laughs> Keith. So there you go. Me and Keith. <laughs> but uh, if you listen carefully, like for instance, uh, this is, what is this, confessional? Like I wrote after Mr. Tawari died. Mr. Tawari was my best friend, my teacher, and the old devotee of Maharaji. That's when, right after that, he dropped Namashibaya on me. I mean, I just knew, the whole song just boom, right? It just came through one day. It was many years later that somebody said to me, or I recognized it myself and said, geez, that's the chord to be, the chords to be cause the night. You know that song, Because the Night? Same song. Springsteen ripped me off. He must have had a time machine gone ahead in time and heard my chant and then gone back and written Because the Night. Can you believe that? So it happens like that. But, you know, the thing is that there's a mixture of... of uh, emotion is, is a very powerful force. And emotional... Uh, the emotions that we felt growing up, a lot of us growing up in the 60s and 70s, it, it, in the 50s. A lot of the emotion is 
caught with music, you know. Music really brought out a lot of emotion. And uh, so I've noticed that some of the chants really have those same chord changes that, but instead of saying, oh, my baby left me, I felt so bad 20 million times, you know, and then having a nervous breakdown, you're saying Sri Ram J Ram and you go up to heaven and have a cup of tea with God. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. But, um, yeah. There was one chant, the, uh, what is it, the, um, what do we call it? The, Mount, the Mountain Hare Krishna from Pilgrim Heart. <sighs> There's a chant, uh, you might have even heard it last night. Every night we play uh, this beautiful, incredible Tibetan Lama, Lama Girme, who lives in Paris. He made a CD called The Lama's Chant about 20 years ago. And I've been listening to it since then. I must have listened to it 40 million times. And I actually, there was one melody I was stuck on for like months and months. And I said, that's it. I'm going to write a Hare Krishna to this melody because I can't stop singing it. And I didn't know the Tibetan words, which are beautiful. And all the very deep invocation of the deities and, and the guru. And so that, the, the Hare, that one, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See, that one. That one was a rip-off of the Tibetan chant. Whew, now I've uh, borrowed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not guilty. But otherwise, they just come through as they come through. and I don't really... I don't edit them that much. I just sing what I like, you know? Can you imagine? So nice. And it was, it was hard at first, you know, I got a lot of flack from people. Uh, you're not doing this the right way. Okay, that's, I'm glad to hear that. Because <laughs> no, somebody else's right way is not my right way. You know, I have to do what works for me. If I wasn't doing what works for me, when you come to sing, when we come to sing together, it wouldn't feel the way it feels. So I'm doing my practice. I'm doing what help, what frees me, what gets me, what straightens me out, what you know, what opens my heart, brings me into that presence, that openness, and so, because that's what I'm doing. We get together, we help each other to do that. Because when I, you know, I was Maharaji left the body in 1973, and I didn't really start singing to people this way until 1994. Stubborn. Stubborn and very unhappy for a long time. And then I was standing in my room in New York and, uh, at the time and literally I was struck with the understanding that if I did not chant with people, and it was very much with people, I would never, never be able to clean out the dark corners in my own heart. And I knew that that's where all the problems were coming from. All the suffering was coming from my own stuff that I could not see and couldn't deal with. And that the only thing that had been given to me that I could do for myself was to start chanting with people. It took a while, actually. It was hard for me for a lot of reasons. And. That's why I sing today. Nothing's changed. I keep. That's why. Why I do what I do. Yeah. Somebody over there. Where's the mic? Okay. We'll get to you next. Okay. Uh, that big poster straight behind you. Uh, that's, that's. That's Durga. Uh, Vin, Vindyavasini Durga Devi. Okay. I was just gonna say I've been hanging out with Rhonda off and on for decades, but. And I know all about Hanuman and Buddha and Maharishi, but Maharaji. Maharaji. Maharishi was. But the else. Uh, the picture behind you is like uh, don't identify from? with it one yeah. bit. And <laughs> that's the Murti in Kenchi. That's a new a new Durga temple that Maharaji built in 1972, about a year before he left the body, right in the courtyard in Kenchi. It's called Vindya Vasini Durga Devi. 
there's a form of the goddess. If you go back in time, one of the early stories is how uh, Shiva was, his first wife was named Sati. Sati. And her father was the king, was the king of the Himalayas. And her father didn't like Shiva because he was smoked hash all the time, wandered around with goblins and ghosts and was, you know, just a total basket case kind of, you know. And so when he gave this big ceremony, this big fire ceremony, he invited all the deities, but he didn't, didn't invite Shiva. And his daughter, Sati, was very angry about that. And she went to confront her father, and he wouldn't listen to her, so she threw herself in the fire. And Shiva shows up on the scene, grabs her body, and he starts flying around the universe in grief. And he was, the, the, he was going to destroy the universe in his grief. So the gods appealed to Vishnu. Vishnu sends out his weapon, which is the chakra, and he cuts up the body of Sati, who's already dead, obviously, you know, cuts her up into ten pieces. And those pieces fell in various places in India, and each of those places is called the Shakti Peet, a, a, a center of extraordinary of power of, of the goddess. One of those places is the Vindhya Hills, Vindhya Hills, Vaishnavi Devi in the Vindhya Hills, and this is a form of that goddess who lives in the Vindhya Hills. The other, another form, another Shakti Peet is Nainital, because the goddess's eyes fell there in the lake. And there's a very ancient Durga temple in Nanital, which is right near Kenji, which is where KK lives in Nanital. So and this is part of the Indian side of stuff. Uh, so she's a form of Durga, the goddess who destroys all difficulties and takes us across the ocean of samsara, the ocean of this world. And Maharaji being Maharaji, in the hills, Kali is worshipped very uh, in many places, and one of the ways Kali is worshipped traditionally is to slaughter a goat or a chicken. So Maharaji said, "I'll build a temple to the goddess, but we'll build it to Vaishnavi Devi, the Shakti of Vishnu, because she doesn't accept any sacrifices. Otherwise, these miserable villages will be dragging their goats in here." He said. So, and so that's what's there. And then you were at, you know, you got to wait for the mic. Where's the mic? You, you can pass it back. Raise your hand. You pass it back to me. That's the temple, by the way. This is the Devi when uh, Maharaji made me the pujari or the priest of the Durga temple. It was this temple. And the reason he made me the priest was because uh, they brought in a Brahmin priest and uh, after a few days they caught him stealing the money out of the donation box. So they sent him home and they brought in a second one and after a few days they found him stealing the money. So they sent him home and they brought in a third one and then after they caught him and sent him home, the temple trust came to Maharaji and they said, Baba, we can't find a priest that won't steal. What are we going to do? Maharaji goes, my priest won't steal. Your priest? Who's your priest? Krishna Das. <laughs> so I was summoned from uh, inner darkness, the back of the temple where everybody spent their time, and asked to sit out there and be the, the pujari. And uh, just want you to know I am qualified for this, you see. Okay, I'll try, I'll try and do this. Um, I'm struck by the, you say power last night was ultimately the true surrender. Like you need power to fully surrender to who you really are. And that we know who we truly are deep inside ourselves. Like all the other stuff is excess and can just be lost, let go of. Exterior. Exterior, can be let go of. Yeah. Yet, on the other side, which to me feels very much about 
individual, not individuality of ego, but just a personal inward journey. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I have this notion of community and belonging and the love and the support that, you know, you just said a few minutes ago, I had to sing with other people. Mm -hmm. And we have other people who've said, I needed to be, you know, I want to be belong. I want to mm -hmm. be in community. Yeah. And um, Trudy talked about a man who was full of hatred. And it wasn't until he got that sense of belonging mm -hmm. that he was able to then find his own love. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted you to speak a little bit about that tension of um, our human need to belong and to be in community and our need to then do the personal work internally. You know, someone asked the Buddha, what's the most important? No, the Buddha asked uh, Ananda, I think, or Sariputra, one of those guys, Which, what, what is the most important thing in, uh, on the path? You know, there, there's three jewels, the Dharma, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which is the most important. And they all said the Buddha, and he said, oh, no, no. The most important thing is Sangha, the satsang, the company, the community of seekers, you know. Uh, ultimately, of course, everything happens inside of you. If, if you will be liberated, if you will be happy, where is it going to happen? Next door? You know, it's going to happen to you, inside of you how that happens and how we can create the, the circumstances for that to arise is different for everybody, but one thing's for sure. Uh, community makes it very possible and much more probable that we can get the strength to go through the difficult times without being completely destroyed by them. You know, people to talk to, people to get advice from, people who might know something friends, people to commiserate with. This is all important stuff. Very few of us are really qualified to be hermits, you know. Uh, so. So it's just, you know, when you think about groups like the KKK or, you know, truly horrific groups. Is KK in the KKK? No, oh, thank goodness. That's a different KKK. KK, different KKK. But so there's the, you know, and so I guess it's somehow nurturing well, the ability to know when the community or the group where you're seeking belonging um, is righteous. Well, yeah, that's, but how will you know? You'll know that inside yourself, and if you find out that you're wrong, then you leave. You know, that's the thing. Uh, groups can go in any direction, of course, and as human beings, we tend to go to the lowest common denominator, you know. Uh, it's just the way we are. We're trained to be stupid, you know, uh, and we practice it with great intensity at every chance we get. So, but in the case of the, the, the satsang or the, the, you know, the, the the friends on the path, you know, you're these are people who you you've got some trust for, that they're doing the right thing for themselves, and they're sharing that with you. But if you get enter, if you get with a group that doesn't work, you know, that's not feeling right to you, why would you stay? You know, I'm not one of those people. You know, some people say, uh, I was told that you, you should uh, only repeat one mantra, you should pick one deity to be. You know, I said, okay, yeah. So, you were told that. Good. Does it work for you? Well, I don't think so. Why would you do it then? Do what works for you. Yeah, as Westerners, we don't have the... Uh, we're coming from, we, we grew up with Mickey Mouse, for Christ's sake. You know, I mean, it's a long way from Mickey Mouse to Rom. Long way. A long way. So you got to start from where you're at. you got to be who you are. you got to find something that you like to do or you'll never do it. You know, I mean, come on, it's just, let's not, uh, let's just get through the day. That's the main thing, you know. It's a long way from Mickey Mouse to Sri Ram J. Ram. Now, there you go. You see where the chants come from? It's another one of the greatest hits of the Kali Yuga. 
Oh God. Where are you? Somebody? Hi. Um, I would love to hear more about Mr. Tuari and your relationship with him and his relationship with Maharaji and anything you'd like to tell us about, about that. Uh, uh. You know, Tuari was, uh, when he was young, when he was young, his parents died. He was raised by, raised by an aunt, and then she died. And uh, he had taken a vow not to marry. And uh, so he was doing severe yoga practices, pranayam. He used to tell me he would tie himself up in certain ways and try to get the energy to get an inch off the ground, you know, and do these really intense practices. And uh, so, but Maharaji finally, uh, they, one day they were traveling together and they went to this house where uh, the father of the house had died, the, the mother had died long before, and everyone was being taken care of by the youngest daughter who was about 20, I think, at the time. And uh, so Maharaji and Tuari arrived and they sit in the living room and this woman, young woman, is going back and forth, bringing them food and water, and Maharaji goes to Tewari, hey, she's kind of cute, huh? <laughs> and Maharaji starts working on it, look how she's serving, how beautiful she is, how beautiful she serves, she's taking care of everybody, you know? He said, you know, She's actually Joan of Arc. <laughs> and then finally he says to her, you should marry her. You know I've, I've vowed not to marry. Yeah, I know, I know, but you should marry her. No, I won't do it. I should do it. Three days they stayed in that room arguing about whether she, he was going to marry this young woman. And finally Tawai says, okay, you want me to marry her? I'll do so under one condition only. This is, he's fighting with his guru for Christ's sake here, you know. What's that? I said, if you write in golden letters on the marriage certificate itself that I, Neem Karoli Baba, take full responsibility for all issue of this marriage and sign it, then I'll marry. I won't do that. Good, then I won't marry. Well, we're not leaving until you agree. Well, then we're not leaving because we're staying on the same Finally, Maharaji said, okay, I'll do it. I have seen the piece of paper. <laughs> Tuari carried it with him wherever he went. He had a little thing where he had some mantras and yantras and everything. And he had the wedding, the marriage certificate with Maharaji's handwriting in golden letters. And uh, so even so, on the day of the marriage, Maharaji shows up and uh, Tuari was living at the, the um, top of the hill. At the, he's a school teacher at the school. And the wedding party was getting ready to leave, and Maharaji shows up about halfway up the hill. So Tuari runs down, and they're just sitting there talking and hanging out. And finally somebody says, Baba, this guy's supposed to get married, and you're letting him sit around down here. The party's waiting for him. So Maharaji looks at him, and he said, Jiao, go. So Tuari, they got married. So I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but one day Tuari looked at me, we were talking about meditation and samadhi and all this, and he says to me, you know, I didn't have my first samadhi until after I got married. <laughs> uh, yeah. this, this woman, Mrs. Tuari Ma, was so great, oh my God. You know, she, she lived in agony. She had to pain all the time from neuropathy, from diabetes. And the, the, she had diabetes and she couldn't treat it because Tuari had, one day Tuari was, well, it's a long story, but Maharaji saved him from tu tuberculosis and told him that he had to uh, be a falahari, falahari, which means a fruit eater the rest of his life couldn't eat any grains and stuff like that, milk and fruit. And so being a good Indian wife, she also stopped eating grains. And when you don't eat food, you can't take the certain medicines uh, to control the blood sugar. So 
and you couldn't convince her. I mean, you, you know. One time she was writhing in pain, and I went up. I said, Ma, are you okay? And she goes, Machine broken, inside okay. But she really meant it. You know, I mean, it's hard for us to understand. She had, it was okay. It wasn't, she just wasn't making it okay. Inside, she was good and dealing with that without a problem. It was quite extraordinary. And to see her smile was like to see the lights go on in the whole universe. You couldn't, I would do anything to, to make her smile a little bit. It was so beautiful. Tawari would explain things to me. He seemed to understand everything, you know. He had studied all the scriptures. He had learned. His first guru was uh, also a, a great guru of KK. His name Brahmachari Maharaj. And he had taught him his pujas and prayers. And, and he would explain things to me. Great, you know, things, really intense questions. He explained them perfectly. And then within a few words of, a few seconds of finishing, a few words out of my mouth, he could see I didn't understand a word he said. And he would look at me and he'd go, my boy, is there something wrong with your brain? <laughs> yeah. He was extraordinary. Um, quite extraordinary. We brought him to America a few times. And he went through this period where he would go into samadhi. I mean, he, he would enter into samadhi very easily every day. I would sleep in the bed with him, and Ma would sleep with the kids when I was there. And he would wake up at 3.30 in the morning, go pee, come back, sit up, boom, and be gone until tea time, about 7 or 8 o'clock. He'd just be gone. I would wake up, look at him, roll over and go back to sleep. And not once in all those years did he ever kind of say like, hey, uh, you want to meditate? He never, he just let me be me. I wish he would have done something else, but he did not. And uh, so he went through this period where actually he would, we would be walking down the street in Berkeley, and he'd just go, and he'd like, he'd almost fall over. He would go into samadhi. He was in these extraordinarily blissful states and be gone. I mean, not breathing. You understand? Like, one time I was sitting with him in the living room, and we were having tea. I think he was still drinking tea at that time. And I had heard a little bit of a prayer uh, with the words, Narayani Namostute. And it really got me, right? So I asked him, have you ever heard this? And he said, oh, yes. I said, would you teach it to me? Oh, sure. So I got my book out. And he started reciting it very slowly, and I was writing it. Then, in, after a couple of minutes, he just started going faster and faster. And, you know, I put the book down, you know. And he, did, he knew the whole prayer. It turned out he did this prayer every day of his life for the last 50 years, right? And he just, he just kind of got lost in it. And by the end, he goes, Om Narayani, Om Narayani, Om. He went into samadhi. Two feet from my face. He wasn't breathing. It really pissed me off. I, there I was. I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a taste of this stuff to save my miserable ass. And this guy couldn't stay out of it long enough to teach me one prayer. And he wasn't trying. Tears were pouring down his face. He was just lost. He was just immersed, you know? So Ma comes in the living room to get the teacups. And I said, Ma, look. We're, we're, look at Baba. We're, when is he going to come back? And as she picked up the cups, she just looked at me. She said, don't know. <laughs> Went back to the kitchen. <laughs> Leaving me with this crying corpse right here. That family, you know, we were talking about families before. Oh, did they fight and yell and scream? It was incredible. And I was living in the living room on the couch. I was in the middle of all of it. In my house, don't talk to me that way. Don't raise your voice to me. Don't look at me like that. In this house, 
There were no rules. They were screaming and yelling and everything. But the thing was, there was never the slightest fear that anybody in that family would throw another person out of their heart. So it was open game, right? It was free, whatever. And he, Tawari used to love to fight. He would say things that would really piss me off. And, I, and then he would look at me and be like, you will fire upon me now? <laughs> you know, you know. And we'd be, I'd be yelling at him, he'd be yelling at me, we'd be eye to eye, nose to nose, and we'd both looking at each other like, wow, this is great, you know? And it was amazing. It was, it was so liberating for me. This is part of what KK was talking about with the family. I was, I was the eldest brother. I was accepted fully, even to this day. I am the eldest brother in that family. The grandchildren bow and touch my feet. I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm just the oldest brother. And it was so wonderful. I can't tell you how much it meant to me. That kind of... To be accepted like that, you know? It was really powerful. And loved like that and shared with like that. And um, trusted like that. I used to, I would, they were, they were a piece of work, this Mr. and Mrs. She had such bad, bad diabetes, she, sometimes she could hardly walk, but we were in Rishikesh and she wanted to go for her Ganga bath, her bath in the Ganga at four in the morning, and there's no way I'm getting up at four in the morning. And, she's, and I locked them in their room. <laughs> <laughs> and she comes, but the room, the door between the two rooms, uh, I was sleeping with the grandson, one of her grandson. The door between the two rooms was open, so she comes in, four in the morning, Katie, Katie, Ganga bath, Ganga bath. I say, Katie, Katie, Ganga bath. So I take the key to the room out, and I hand it to the grandson. I said, you watch her. And sure enough, she fell down the stairs and ripped, you know, so there I am, I'm walking around with this little old lady, taking her to the doctor, and there's big white monkeys walking around with this little Indian woman, and everybody's looking at like, what is this about, you know? I was so proud to be helping her. It was such a great feeling. And um, I took her to the doctor, she got her earrings, her ears stitched back up, because her big hoop earrings got, you know, got caught when she fell and ripped her ears. And, and I yelled at her, and she just went, Next morning, four o'clock. Kitty, Ganga Snam, Ganga Bath. I couldn't say no, right? You know, I remember when I was living in the temple with Maharaji, I would keep thinking, you know, there's a town like, you know, Nanital is just 30 minutes away. Where are the devotees? They don't come to see him? I don't understand that. And I was like, these people are weird. What's wrong with these people? And I realized later, there's nothing wrong with them. That what was wrong was me. They have him wherever they are. They have him. They're doing their duty. They're living their lives as he wants them them to live their lives. They're taking care of their families, they're working in their shops, they're doing what they have to do. And they are in his presence all the time, in that loving presence all the time. And it was me who wasn't in it. And I was judging them, you know. It was very interesting when I noticed that. To our, we used to go places, we used to travel together, and we went to uh, Chitrakut, which is this place that's very sacred to Ram. And we were staying in this ashram, and it happened to be Shiv Ratri. And Tuari was a great devotee of Shiva, and he actually worshipped Maharaji as Shiva, Guru as Shiva. And Shiv Ratri is the night that you, you usually do a long puja, almost all night long you do a puja. And they used to do she, Mr. and Mrs. used to stay up all night. He would belt the mantras out at the top of his lungs because that's how his guru told him to do it. 
They told him that when you do your puja, you must do it at the top of your lungs, no matter where you are. And once you start doing the puja, you cannot stop until it's finished, no matter what happens. Interesting. So this night we were in Chitrakuta, and they went from like eight in the morning till about eight at night till about six in the morning at the top of his lungs. And Ma's making all the offerings and ringing the bell and doing all this, and Baba is, Mr. Tuari is yelling and. So we opened the door of this little room we were in, and all the Babas in the ashram were standing in the courtyard like this. They had never heard anything like this before. You know, being a Baba can be like a being a... It's, it's like a profession, you know? You, you walk around, you beg a little bit here, you stay in, in this ashram, you do some meditation if you feel like it. It's kind of like... When they heard the real thing, they were they just like this. It was amazing. I walked out of the room. What are you? And, they, you know, and the head of that ashram said to me, oh, you're really lucky to know him. But he was a school teacher, and then he was a headmaster of a school. He didn't leave. He didn't disappear, you know. He was right in the world. And inside the world, he did whatever he had to do. It's quite extraordinary. And he would argue with Maharaji. One time, he came to the temple uh, in Kenshi from Nanital, and he starts yelling at Maharaji from across the courtyard. Why did you drag me here? I was happy at home. I had no intention to come. Like this, you know. Imagine you talk to your guru like this. That's kind of love. That's kind of the fearlessness. There was no fear in this relationship, you know. And Maharaji says, yep, I drag no one. But for 83 lives we'd been together. It had to happen. I mean, what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Neen, where's the mic? I sit here and I have Maharaji envy. <laughs> um, you know, the... Thanks. She got it. Yeah, okay, go ahead. The stories are so ex exotic compared to the Western lives we live. And I know that you, I mean, you answered my question, but I guess I'm looking for something back from you. And that is, yes, we live in our lives and keep, you know, Maharaji ever present. But the yearning is kind of intense sometimes. Um, you know, you guys were on the bus, and we sit here and love to hear the stories. But there's a part of me that feels like, how is it, how is it that you have all this physical time with him? And I'm What's still it? the same schmuck I always was. No, yeah. I think you're a really great guy. Oh, thank you. But what's it? I mean, what's it like? It's just so I don't know. I guess I just I wish I'd been there. No, you don't. Well, yeah, I do. Dysentery, pooping your pants <laughs> off all day long. What are you doing? Well, I hate to tell you, girl, but yearning is what saves your ass. Without that, you have nothing. And it's, work, it's designed like that. Um, that longing to be in the love is the only thing that that's our sense of direction. We think it's a mistake, but it's actually the one thing that saves us. And it ruins your life. Until it doesn't. Until when, which side of that are you on, you know? It takes a long time to overcome like the, the gravity of Earth, so to speak, and embody that longing and recognize what it is, you know? It's, it's the connect, it's already the connection. Because what do you, the thing you're longing for, you already know what it is. You may not know here, but your heart is longing for it, it knows. And it makes sure that everything falls apart and what's left is that. 
And that's what saves you. Saves us, all of us. It, you know. That's my only qualification, period, for anything is the longing. Yeah, I've been to shrinks. They called it something else. <laughs> Too bad for them. But that's the thing that, that keeps... It's the first noble truth. It's the truth of, of suffering. The fact that stuff isn't enough. However beautiful it is at this moment, it's not going to be that beautiful ten moments from now. But what it will be and is already that beautiful is what you're learning for. And you know that. So, those thoughts that you have, that you express, for instance, when you sit, when you chant, Ram Ram. They caught you. They continue to catch you. The more practice you do, the more you align yourself with the yearning, the less those thoughts will uh, find a place to land. And then it won't be a problem. Of course, there's the other side of it. I had learned this beautiful bhajan, this devotional song of Mirabai. And I dreamed of singing it to Maharaji, right? And I learned it. And one day I was alone with him, or maybe there was one other Indian guy there. And, and I asked him, can I sing this song? Huh? So I started singing this Mira Bhajan, and I was weeping and crying and singing. And, and I finish, and he leans over to me and says, why are you crying? <laughs> and I said, Maharaji's love, which was bullshit. I was crying because I had dreamed of being a person who sings and cries. And there I was doing it. Next. It was so funny, I couldn't believe it. But he wasn't fooled, you know. Why are you crying? <laughs> so, you can kind of do a trip about it too, you know. You, you don't want to go too much to this side, you know, start wandering around, you know, starving yourself to death. And you don't want to go too far to this side. The longing is in you right now as you are. It's not somebody else. It's not wrong. It's not, you know, it's actually, that's the path. And what you have to do to stabilize in that, you'll find out what that is. And, you know, I, I don't even attempt to, but I will remind you of this Rumi poem, you know, called uh, Love Dogs. It's a beautiful poem. It says, uh, a man was crying, Allah, Allah, and a voice came to him and said, why are you crying out? Do you ever get an answer? And the guy thought, right, I don't. So he stopped praying. And he fell into a confused sleep, and the, the guide of souls came to him and said, why did you stop praying? The guy says, I never got an answer. And the guy says, the calling out is the answer. You hear the dog howling in the night for his master? That's the connection. And he says, there are dogs that no one knows the name of. Give your life to be one of them. <laughs> Room is too much. Somebody? No? Yeah. I had read, Katie, that uh, recently you had 
Dunkirtan in prison in Vermont. By inv invitation. Yeah, I understand. Luckily. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, could you share a little bit about that experience and, and, and how it was? Please. Say please again. Please again. Mm. Okay. No, it was actually beautiful, really. Uh, it was in a very minimum, minimum security prison, a women's prison outside of Burlington. And most of the inmates were there for drug offenses. Mostly, nobody stayed longer than six months. It was just a kind of a halfway house almost, but it was a prison. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, foundation called the Call and Response Foundation uh, sponsored us in there. Somebody, an inmate who had read my book, Chance of a Lifetime, had, and had it in prison. It was stolen from her in prison. <laughs> she asked them to invite us, and so they did, and we went there. And, uh, you know, it was just me and Arjun and uh, <clears throat> some of the other people from the foundation and stuff. And, and there, apparently there were uh, <clears throat> maybe 30 or 40 prisoners who were going to come. But the day before, somebody in the prison, whether it's a prisoner or a guard or somebody, had started talking about demon worship and scared a lot of the, the people about, I mean, you know, monkeys and all that stuff, you know. So about 20 of the women came, and maybe there were 30 people in the room, and a lot of them were these young girls, like 20, 21, 22, and they kind of came in like this, chewing gum, you know. And, you know, I wrote the words up on a little blackboard, kind of, and I just started talking, and we started singing, and by the end, it was a love fest. It was incredible. Except at one point, one of the guards, a couple of guards came in the room to take roll, make sure everybody who was supposed to be there was there, so we just sat there like this. They were the only uptight people I met, the guards. And uh, it was really sweet. It was just uh, really sweet. Yeah. For me, it was the same, you know, whether it's here, there, or anywhere. It makes, by His grace, it really doesn't change me the way I do what I do. But I do find myself in some strange places. But um, it was very beautiful. Nobody wanted to leave, you know, everybody wanted to hang out. It was really very nice. Um, how would you say that your practice has impacted you being a grandfather? <laughs> I don't know. I think I started that ball rolling a long time ago, so to speak. It's just kind of manifesting now. Um, chanting makes me a better grandfather. My, my grandson Bodhi loves to play tabla, so I'll go over to the house and we'll sing together, and he'll he'll play tabla. Then I'll go running around, and I'll come back to the tabla, and I'll come running. You know, it's, um, it's sweet. It's very sweet. Very sweet. And it's you know, it's also tough to see uh, the uh, the conditioning going in. You know. Oh, you know, you know, and uh, I know where my daughter got her stuff from. There's no mystery there. <laughs> you know, and now I'm seeing my grandson get the same stuff. Generation later, maybe a little bit less here, maybe a little bit more of that. 
it's pretty interesting. It's, you gotta kind of have to let it be and love it all, you know? And uh, so, you know, let's be serious. You know, practice helps everything, you know? The more, the more you live in your own heart, the better everything is. The better, the more everything around you becomes part of your practice as well. You know, it's not just practice while you're sitting down like this. You know, we do practices to become good human beings, to, to get the strength to be a good, full-on human being. Someone who cares about other people a little bit, you know, not always me, 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 me. Somebody who has the, the strength to help other people and develop some compassion and kindness in life and someone who's trying not to be the same jerk that they were last week or last month or, you know, somebody who's not working on giving up fear and, and not isolating our hearts from everybody all the time, you know. This is a human being. This is not a deity. We're trying to become good human beings. That takes a lot of strength, inner strength, or inner power, or whatever you want to call. And uh, it's not. It's it's a full-time job. It's a lifetime job. As a segue, sorry, just right next door, that was easy. Ah, <laughs> as a segue from that, um, as a grandparent looking back, if you could give advice to a parent, maybe you as a parent, to help your child find, yeah, this is a good one, huh? <laughs> but you spoke about um, trusting yourself or knowing your true nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. What could you help a child do or say to help them trust and know their true nature so they don't have to do all the stuff that we've done <laughs> well i know karma and all that stuff i mean all i can say is you, you the more love you have the more you love yourself the more you accept yourself the more you can accept other people as they are and love them as they are and certainly with a child you know that's the main thing you want to let them know is that they're loved regardless of whether they fuck up or do well or do this or do that. You know, you don't want to get caught always being reactive. You know, you want to support that love, that acceptance, and give them that strength. You do the best you can, you know. That's all. What else can you do? We're all doing the best we can, you know. We could be doing better maybe, but still the best we can at the moment. And this, that's good enough for now. It's, a, it's, you know, I watched Bodhi, I watched my grandson, you know, and I saw that, you know, he didn't come in a blank slate. There was a lot of stuff going on in there right from day one. You know? And he's got a personality that, I don't know where the hell it came from. There's nobody I ever saw before. It's very interesting. So, there's a lot of love that you have to, an acceptance and letting that person be who they are, you know. But if we, can, if we don't have that for ourselves, if we don't feel good about ourselves, that's what we're transmitting whether we want to or not. You can't fool anybody in this world for long, you know. So, being honest with ourselves is really, it's not easy, but it's, it's a big step. And you can maybe be honest with other people. Maybe. Okay, so I see it's time for Johnny. <laughs> yeah, so it's 3.30, we gotta go. Um, I don't know. We'll sing every night 
But if somebody has questions or something, I suppose we could take a few minutes. The thing about the night is that we have to be finished by 9.30, because there are people who would rather be watching television. <laughs> right here in River City. So uh, we can spend some time talking or not. It's up to you, really. So you let me know. Namaste.